Hello, and welcome to 5 Year Club video number 193. Yet another Japanese story, this time brought to you by my phone. Very exciting. And uh, today is the story A Feather in Daikoku's Cap. One for his bales of rice, two for his two floor mansion, three for his store sheds, three floors high. So ran the Daikoku dancer's song. And if you looked for someone to fit it, in Kyoto, there was the wealthy merchant called Daikokuya. When Gojo Bridge was being changed from wood to stone, he purchased the third plank from the western end and had it carved into a likeness of the god Daikuku, praying that by spending his life, as the plank had done, in useful service beneath the feet of customers, he might attain to great wealth. In profit, in faith, there is profit and his household steadily grew more prosperous. He called himself Daikukuya Shinbai, and the name was known to all. He had three sons, all safely reared to manhood and all gifted with intelligence. The old man, delighted at such good fortune, was passing his declining years in great satisfaction and getting ready for retirement when the eldest son, Shinroku, suddenly started to spend recklessly, visiting the brothel quarters again and again with no account of the expense. After half a year, the clerks discovered that 170 kanme of the money recorded in their cash books had disappeared. When it became clear, however, that Shinroku could never repay the money, they worked secretly together on his behalf and, by falsifying the prices of goods being held in stock, managed to get him safely through the next reckoning day in the seventh month. But for all their earnest pleas that he should live less extravagantly in the future, he took no notice. And at the reckoning for the, the year, the cash was short again, by 230 kanme. A fox with his tail exposed, Shinroku could play his tricks no more, and he sought refuge with a friend who lived by the, na by the Inari Fox Shrine at Fushimi, south of Kyoto. His father, a straight-laced old man, was furious, and no amount of pleading softened his temper. Summoning the neighborhood group to come to his house in formal dress, he publicly denounced his son and abandoned him to his own devices. When a father dissociates himself in this way from his own son, it is for no trifling misdemeanor. Shinroku was now in sorry straits. It was impossible for him to remain in the vicinity, even in his present refuge. But if he was to leave and make for Edo, he must have money. And at the moment, he had not even the price of a pair of sandals for the journey. Was there ever a more unhappy case than mine, he moaned, but self-pitying did nothing to mend his fortune. It was on the evening of the 28th of the 12th moon, soon after Shinroku had entered the bathtub in his lodgings, that someone shouted the dread alarm of his father's approach. Terrified, Shinroku leaped up, leaped from the tub, hastily draped a padded kimono about his dripping body, and fled into the street. He held his sash in one hand, but had somehow forgotten to retrieve his underwear, and now that Shinroku was eager at last to get ready for the walk to Edo, the absence of his loincloth was truly unfortunate. It was not until the 29th that he finally set out. The skies were overcast, and as he passed Fuji no Mori, south of Kyoto, the snow that had long threatened began to fall and settled on the pines. Shinroku was hatless, and icy drops oozed past his collar. By sundown, his spirits still further depressed by the booming of temple bells, he was gazing with longing at the steaming tea urns in the cozy rest houses of Okamadani and Kanshuji. A sip of tea, he felt, was the very thing to ward off this bitter cold. Having no money, however, he bided his time until he noticed a house before which the palanquins from Fushimi or Otsu were drawing up with particular frequency. It was jammed tight with customers, and in the general confusion he quenched his thirst free of charge, and as he left he took the opportunity to appropriate a straw cape that someone had momentarily laid aside. After this initiation into the art of thieving, he proceeded along the road toward the village of Ono. There, beneath the branches of a desolate, leafless persimmon tree, he came across a group of children bewailing some misfortune. 
What a shame, he heard one say. Poor old Benke's dead. Stretched on the ground before them was a huge black dog the size of a carter's ox. Shinroku went up to the children and persuaded them to let him have the carcass. Wrapping it in the straw cape he had stolen, he carried it with him as far as the foot of Otawa Hill, and there addressed some laborers who were digging in the fields. This dog, said Shinroku, should make a wonderful cure for nervous indigestion. For more than three years I have fed him on every variety of drug, and now I intend to bury him into black medicinal ash. Well, there's something we should all... Well, that that's something we should all profit from, exclaimed the laborers, and fetching brushwood and withered bamboo grass from around them, they produced their tender wallets and started a, fi a fire. Shinroku gave a little of the ash to each of them, flung the remainder across his shoulders, and set off again. Oh, now we got a, a nice image here. Shinroku is chased out of the bathtub by his enraged father, who is waving a long stick. The surprised landlady, wearing a cotton cap, and her two attendants are attempting to bring the old man back to his senses. A clerk left follows Shinroku with his clothes. Well, that's dramatic. He looks pretty calm for someone with no loincloth. All right. And... His shoulders and set off again. Crying, burned wolf powder, mimicking the curious local dialect, he proceeded to hawk his wares along the road, passing the Osaka barrier gate, where people come and people go, both those you know and those you know not. He persuaded all and sundry to stop and buy, even peddlers of needles and hawkers of riding brushes, who had long experienced themselves in swindling travelers, were taken in by him, and between... Oiwake and Hacho, he sold 580 zenny worth of ash. What a pity, he told himself, never to have realized until now what a born genius he was. If he had used his wits like this in Kyoto, no worrisome walk to Ido would ever have been necessary. Laughing at the thought, and at the same time on the verge of tears, he pressed on across the long bridge at Sita and steeled himself to think only of what laid eastward. He passed New Year's Day at a lodging house in Katsusatsu, where even he refreshed himself on the local uba cakes. He caught a glimpse of Mirror Mountain and wept again for Kyoto and the old familiar mirror cakes of home. But soon, like those first blossoms on Cherry Hill, buds of hope were stirring in his breast, and then as he sensed the fragrance and the color, of his full-flowering youth, he knew that he was ready and able to work, and he laughed at the weak-kneed ancient god of poverty behind him struggling to keep pace. I like that line from this, and he laughed at the weak-kneed ancient god of poverty behind him struggling to keep pace. That's a good payday phrase. You get paid, and then you're like, ha ha ha, weak-kneed ancient god of poverty struggling behind me to keep pace. That's what I'm going to say my next payday. All right. At Uiso, even the age-old shrine was young with the spirit of spring, its trees white with sacred festoons, and the moon above, so sad in autumn, shone bright with promise for the future. Doubts lay demolished like the old barrier gates he passed at Fuwa, and day in, day out, he trudged onward. Taking the Mino Road... To Owari and hawking his powder around every village, every town and village on the Tokaido, the eastern seaboard highway. At last, on the 62nd day after leaving Kyoto, he arrived at Shinagawa. Now that he had, then now that he not only had supported himself all this way, but also had made an overall profit of 2,300 zenny, he threw the unsold remains of the black powder into the waves by the shore, and hurried on toward Edo. But it grew dark, and as he had nowhere in Edo to stay, he passed the night before the gate of the Tokaiji Temple at Shinagawa. Beneath its shelter, a number of outcasts were lying, stretched out under their straw capes. It was spring, 
But the wind from the sea was strong, and the roar of the waves kept him from closing his eyes until midnight. The others were recounting their life stories, and lying awake he listened to them. Although all of them were beggars now, it seemed that none was so by inheritance. One was from the village of Tatsuta in Yamato, and had formerly been a small brewer of sake, supporting a family of six or seven in tolerable comfort. However, when the money he had been steadily putting by amounted to 100 koban, he decided that getting rich by running a local business was a slow process, and, disregarding all that his relations and friends said to dissuade him, he abandoned his shop and came down to Ito. Following his own foolhardy impulses, he rented a shop from a fishmonger in Gofukucho and started a business alongside all the high-class sake stores. He could not, however, compete with the products of Konoike, Itami, and Ikea? No, ha ha ha, Ikeda. Or with the cedar-barreled sake of the long-established, powerful Nara breweries, and when the capital with which he had started his shop had dwindled to nothing, he took the straw matting from a 16-gallon tub of sake to serve as a coat and took the road and took to the road as a beggar. I thought I should go back to Tatsuta in embroidered scarlet silks, but now I'd go back if I had even so much as a new cotton kimono, he wailed. It just shows you that you should never abandon a business you're used to. I'm not sure about that. But words were useless. Although the time of wisdom had come, it was too late. Another of the outcasts was from Sakai, to the south of Osaka, in Izumi province. A master of a thousand arts, he had come to Ido in high hopes, swollen with conceit. In calligraphy, he had been granted lessons by Hirano Chuan. In tea, he had drunk at the stream of Kanamori Soa. Okay, hold on. Uh... In tea he had drunk. That's not a complete sentence. Chinese verse and prose composition he had learned under Jinsai of Fukakusa and for linked verse and Hakai he had been a pupil of Nishiyama Soin. In no drama he had mastered the dramatic style of Kopatake and the drum technique of Shoda Yomen. Mornings he had listened to Ito Genchiki expounding on the classics. Evenings he had practiced kickball under Lord Asukai. During the afternoon he had joined in Ginsai's chess classes and at night he had learned Koto fingering from the cuts. Man, this is a hard sentence. <laughs> from the Yatsuhashi Kingyo and blowing the flute as a pupil of Sosan. In Jururi recital, he learned the style of Uji Kadayu, and in dancing, he was the equal of Yamatoya no Jinbai. In the art of love, he had been trained by the great Shimabara courtesan Takahashi. And in revels with the boy actors, he had copied to perfection the mannerisms of Suzuki Hayachi, under the guidance of the professional entertainers in both the Shimi Shimabara and the unlicensed quarter he had developed into a pleasure seeker of exquisite refinement. If there was anything that a man could do, he had sought out a specialist in it and had copied his technique and he was now proudly regarded and he now proudly regarded himself as one qualified to succeed in any task to which he might turn his hand but these years of rigorous training proved of little use in the immediate business of earning a living and he soon regretted that he had ever used an abacus that he had never used an abacus and had no knowledge of the scales at a loss in samurai households useless as a merchant's apprentice his services were scorned by all reduced to his present plight he had cause to reconsider his opinion of himself, and he cursed the parents who had taught him 
the arts, but omitted any instruction in the elements of earning a living. A third beggar of Edo was born and bred like his father before him. Although he had once owned a large mansion and grounds in Toricho, drawing a regular income of 600 koban per annum from the house rents, he had no conception of the meaning of the simple word economy, and before long he had sold everything except the walls and roof of his house. Left without a means of support, he abandoned society and his home, and took the life of a beggar, an outcast in practice, even if not registered as one with the Kurama Zenshichi's guild. Listening to each of these life stories, different though they were from one another, Shinroku felt they were all very like his own, and his sympathy was aroused. He moved nearer to where the others were lying. I too am from Kyoto, he said, and added, concealing nothing of his disgrace. I have been disowned by my father and was going to Ido to try my luck, but listening to your stories has disheartened me. Was there no way of excusing yourself, the beggars exclaimed? Had you no aunt to intercede for you? You would have been far better to you would have been far better advised never to have come to Ido. That is past, and I cannot retrace my steps. It is advice for the future that I require. It surprises me that men so shrewd as each of you should be reduced to such distress. Surely you could have made a living of some sort, no matter what trade you chose. Far from it. This may be the greatest. This may be the great castle town of the shogun, but it is also the meeting place for all the sharpest men in Japan, and they won't give you three zenny for nothing. In Edo, you cannot get anywhere without capital. But during all the time you've been looking about, have no fresh ideas for trade occurred to you? Well, you could pick up the empty shells that people scatter all over the town, burn them at Raigonjima and sell the ashes as lime. Or, since people are hard-pressed for time in this place, you could shred edible seaweed or shave dried bonito into flower strips and sell them by the plateful. Or you could buy a roll of cotton and sell it piecemeal as hand towels. Apart from these, apart from things like this, there seems to be no way of starting trade on almost empty, on an almost empty pocket. Their words had given him the idea he wanted. At dawn he took his leave, and when he gave the three of them a parting gift of one hundred zenny each, their delight knew no bounds. Your luck has come, they cried. You'll make a pile of money as high as Mount Fuji. After this, he went to visit an acquaintance who had a cotton goods shop in Tinmacho, and there he related the details of his present predicament and his plans. The shopkeeper was sympathetic. In a case like this, honest work is the only answer, he said. Try your luck at trade for a bit. Taking heart, Shinroku purchased a roll of cotton. <coughs> Sorry, uh, purchased a roll of cotton on which he had set his mind, and cut it up for sale as hand towels. On the twenty-fifth of the third month, the festival day of the Tenjin Shrine at Shitaya, he started his new business. Seated at the base of the holy water font by the entrance, he offered his towels for sale. The pilgrims. The pilgrims, believing that this was another way of improving their luck, bought them gladly, and at the end of the first day he had already made a profit. Every day thereafter he made more money, and within ten years he was rumored to be worth 5,000 koban. For shrewdness he was considered in a class of his own. People took Shinroku's advice on many matters, and he became a treasured asset in the area. On his shop awnings he printed a picture of the god Daikoku wearing a reed hat, and his firm was known as the Hatted Daikokuya. Eight for the daimyo's agent, nine for the nuggets of gold in his stock, ten for a tale's happy ending. And happy, too, was his lot in living in this tranquil age. All right, and that is it for Five Year Club video number 193. Now, this beautiful story. Go back to the title here and reread it so we know what we did. This is my first time doing a screencast on my phone with a uh, with a headset with a microphone. So I'm interested in the quality on this because this is a super compact way to film videos if I can. And I'm about to go on a trip. All right, a feather in Daikoku's cap. So a guy who lost his way running a business tried to uh, um, you know cheating his way to the top and then came back to do business. So earn an ob uh, earn an honest living. And uh, that is it for Five Year Club video number 193. I hope you enjoyed it.